our communication in daily life. So uh, um, there are many branches of linguistic, like applied linguistic or social linguistics. Yes, yes, so, many self-fields. Yeah. Um, we think that the goal of linguistic is to help our communication in our daily life. Thanks. That is very well, I mean, heartwarming uh, answer, you know, very helpful and it can help uh, our communication. Okay, I hope that really, um, you know, that is a, that is a very good, uh, you know, inspiration for other linguists to help us communicate well and to help us express ourselves and make uh you know the language actually is what we use and how to communicate every day right okay that's a very good answer thank you and we'll talk about some subfields today all right okay how about the group um over there um it's gua bao zu, right gua bao group <laughs> okay how about you guys anyone want to share with us yeah <laughs> okay um so we decided that we would um sets the foundation in how we understand um, the different languages and how people acquire their languages differently throughout the collections and air. So, mm -hmm. yeah. Yes, yes, I like the word you use foundation, right? It's like the foundation, it's the, you know, the uh, very fundamental uh, thing about how you use your language. And actually, yeah, for the study of linguistics, we're concerning about the every aspect of language. So including the sound, phonetics, also the semantics, the meaning, and also how you use it, and also the grammar, the syntax, the sentence patterns the word order, everything about language, okay? Thank you very much, great answer. How about, how about group DBK? Are you guys ready? <laughs> DBK, <laughs> sounds like a Korean group. <laughs> okay. Yeah? Um, our conclusion is that I think linguistic is important because language is uh, important. Language is important, yes. Because it can connect people. Oh, I like this answer. It connects everyone, right? Yeah. It can connect everyone and connect, actually can connect you and your family and your friends. And it can also connect you and the world if you know their language, right? So I, I think that's a very good answer, the connection, okay, to connect with others. Okay, how about Machalate? Yes. So okay. we all agree with the previous points that the other team um, bring about. Yes. And we would like to add another point about because we are thinking about the relationship between language and the other fields like computer science Great. So for example chat gpt which is a oh, really hot issue really it thing, is right? very popular so and before yeah, chat GPT, we have google translate yes. so there are all some like language related like computer science related stuff right that's and we're right thinking about in order to establish that mechanism or program in addition to the like engineers I yes yes we need some big points to uh to to provide some linguistic approach into that mechanism because, that's right yeah uh, for example google translate is not you know there uh you know at, at the first hand uh people uh human beings need to create that so uh, uh if we can like import some linguistic knowledge into that like like syntax uh technology technology and then that's a program and that can help people help society Good, good, thank you. That's a very good point. Actually, as uh, Guan Ting just mentioned, you can call it GT, okay, Guan Ting. <laughs> as GT just mentioned, the technology that we use, Google Translate, Google Searching Engine, and ChatGPT, and also Siri, you know, actually they are all based and you know the based on linguistic knowledge. And linguists or we can call also language engineer are also help a lot in building and constructing this kind of device and making things happen and more convenient for people. So for Google Translate, you're right, actually, how can it translate? I think Google Translate is actually advanced, uh, becoming more advanced year after year because there's so many uh, linguists, they also help with this. They they um, compare the grammar, the linguistic pattern, the vocabulary, the lexicon, the meaning, and try their best to make sure the translation is, is accurate as possible although it's not perfect because the machine can still there are still limitations however you're right that a uh, linguist and 
linguistics can be applied to the technology and also the artificial intelligence nowadays to help us um, in many ways. Okay, that's a very good point. How about IPSL? Very challenging. Okay, so in our group, we yeah. try to discuss how linguistics works in our daily life. Yes. And as Dick mentioned, uh, it helps us to communicate with others. That's true, so definitely. We think linguistics help us to learn a language. That's right. right. How to learn so language we, well. So we, because we have mistake in our group, so yes. we try to uh, set an example. Uh -huh. uh, we, if we want to learn Korean, sometimes we need to learn how how the rules goes in Korean. Yes, uh, it's yes. also uh, related to linguistics, and we also can uh, relate it to different fields. So when we are in senior high school, mm -hmm. we learn physics. Yes. So we also need to learn the theory about the uh, about the physics, right? Yes. So, yes. So when we try to learn language, we also need to learn. Linguistics, so it's yes. very important for oh, us. Oh, that's a very language. interesting analogy. And, and also, yeah. uh, we also talked about countries' culture. So the language sometimes, because Mr. Kim said, uh, can represent a uh, country's culture. culture. That's so true. if you want to know the deeper culture. Um, uh, culture about the country, yes. you can start from their language. So in Taiwan, we 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 can learn Taiwanese to learn more better about the culture about, uh, of Taiwan. That's a very good point. Yeah, actually, we will also explore language and culture this semester. And you guys are right, because language reflects our culture, how we think, you know, and also all the words that we use has a meaning. And there, there are stories and customs and cultural meanings behind it, the connotations. So that's a very good point. Thank you very much. And what is the example you used of the rule that if you need to learn Korean? Is there any dif the rule different from Chinese? Uh -huh. Can you give me an example on that? Grandma. Grammatical, grammatical rule, grammar. We Korean usually like subjects. Oh, and subject S. And verb. No. Subjects. Objects. Objects and oh. verbs. Oh, okay. So it's. In English, it's I love you, but in Korean, it's I, you, love. Yeah. Can you say in, Ch in Korean for us? Oh, uh, daughter, 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 Switzerland, right? Yeah. Switzerland. Yeah. Um, you don't really have a word, or you can say all. <laughs> it's free, free, so people can understand you. Do you, can you use only use the verb, or just uh, um, you still need to add subject and object? Yeah yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. And also in German, but in German it's also free because once I think people can refer and understand the meaning from the context. So when you say it to someone, they know what you mean, right? It's okay. So sometimes the grammatical order can be different, like S V O or S O V or S O V S V O. Yeah. And in English, it's I love you. Like in Chinese, it's Wu I Ni. Right. So so it's it's amazing that each language has their different um, grammatical word order. And I think in German, there's a marker for the verb. Right. There's a marker attached to the verb. I mean, different verb have different inflections form, inflectional form, right? So it's actually the grammar is embedded in the verb too, right? Yeah, thank you very much. Okay, so thank you all for your great answers. It's a great beginning of this course. So today we will talk about the introduction to linguistics. And um, in my linguistics course, I think this is a very important first course for you because I don't want to just jump into the subfield and tell you, you have to learn this, you have to study this because you're taking this course. I want you to really know and think about why we need to do this, why we need to learn it. And as an English educator or as a teacher in the future, I think this is very important. You have to know why and you have to know the reasons why we're here um, you know, as a teacher, as a student, and as a future educator, okay? All right, so first let's take a look at these pictures, okay? So, any, can anyone tell me what this is? Oh, sorry, it's a 301, yeah. 
Not the newest, not the newest, but still you know what I mean, right? What can I help you with? Okay, how, how many of you have used this um, you know, every day or what, what is that? Okay, April, so what is this? Siri, okay, so you use Siri every day? Yeah. I know, you cannot live without her, right? Yeah. Okay, so is she still working well in Taiwan? Perfect, great. You yep, think you feel safe, right? You know, I, I used to, I used to, um, before the pandemic, I was in Chicago. I was in New Chicago and I had my Alexa, Alexa with me um, at my place. And when I, when I'm back to Taiwan, I think when I turn it on and when she's alive and talking to me, I feel, oh, I brought Alexa back from the U.S. <laughs> it's safe, you know, and she's still playing music and doing everything, but still, She's following the weather in Chicago, so you know that's the same thing, right? If you didn't switch the location, there was still well, my phone automatically. Oh, okay, that's a better one. Okay, <laughs> all right. So this is the Siri. Actually, Siri, you know, um, they can help you in many ways. You can talk to her, and actually, it's using an automatic voice recognition device. And actually, Siri has a very—I think it can recognize her voice. Very accurately, right? Usually, um, you know, I, I, I can't find many hours there. And actually, it's very helpful based on the phonetic knowledge, phonetic knowledge. Phonetic is about the sound pattern, the, uh, you know, the vowel, the consonant. And you have learned phonetics with me last semester, right? Most of you did. So, you know, phonetics actually play an important part in inventing or in this device like uh, the Siri uh, automatic voice recognition device. Okay. All right. How about Google Translate? I think one thing just mentioned a lot. How many of you use Google Translate a lot? Yes, you did. Okay, Isabel, so do you like it? Yeah. So how often do you use it from what language to what language? Um you usually use it daily because daily. it's like the camera function where I can just um, scan the Chinese words. I'm done. Yeah, it's so convenient. You can just scan it and you can recognize the tags and translate for you, right? Yeah, it really helps a lot and so convenient and fast. But is there any, um, have you found any errors lately? Or yeah, there are, they are a lot, right? <laughs> <laughs> we are right. Okay. So how would you do, well, how would you solve the problem if, it, if you found something wrong or weird or not? Uh, sometimes I switch to Instead of German, I switch to English, and then it's better, or I can, like, get... Yes, yes. I think with English, maybe the data is more, I mean, for Google, because it's a U.S.-based company, so maybe for English, there will be there will be more input and data for you to um, translate, right? <laughs> yeah, double check with another language. That's a good way. And um, how many of you have used Google Translate in your writing or reading yes emily uh, no, what have you but one of my uh, one of my students that i took her uh -huh. he uses it every time he oh. writes it home where it's not a good thing no 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 yeah when when they're reading yeah. you just copy and then paste it on the translator and then he doesn't have to read it in english oh so but when i see it i'm not like to do that but yes 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 when when no one sees him he, he relies on it a lot. For them right that's now. right. That's right. Yeah. yeah, yeah. So I don't think it's his fault, but because he also has to finish his homework and he just doesn't know which way is better to finish it. Yes, yes. I think that's a problem of the new gen younger generation now because it's so convenient and easy, and everybody has a laptop, iPad. So. It, it's very important to teach them how to use this kind of device to help them, but not to, you know, um, you know, uh, actually interrupt their writing or their independent thinking, right? So it's for teachers' homework. I think for the teacher in the future generation, it's very important to know. All right, first thing you need to know how to use it, how to use ChatGPT. You have to give it a try. You have to know. You you have to become familiar with this kind of device, and you have to think about how you can guide your students um, into using those things to help. Maybe for the proofread or double check, but for the first try, it's better to encourage them to give it a try on their own, right? Not to just rely on it. And yeah, it's, it's such a pity that some kids are using it that way. Okay, how about uh, any other people who likes Google Translate? Uh, Mr. Kim, okay, yes. So how did it help you? Um, it is, um, 
I'm trying to read Chinese in dormitory, so I have to like scan. Yes, it's uh, similar to Isabel's function, right? You, you can scan the text and it can translate it into maybe the correct meaning. Yeah, okay. But have you checked with the a real person sometimes <laughs> in your dorm? <laughs> no? Okay. Okay, great, great. Okay. Yeah, perhaps some, you know, if you find something, you know, not very, um, reasonable or weird in google translate sometimes you can also check with a real person <laughs> i mean there are lots of mandarin speakers around you right so try to ask them and you know sometimes um translation can be a good topic for you to connect with the international friends and visitors so i think it would be a good topic for you to you know make new friends too okay all right Quentin, you're using that too yeah yeah i like google translate too because i think it's a group Really good thing I mm -hmm. I always use that as for my proofreading. Oh, proofreading. Okay. You know, uh, when I write in English, English is not my first language. Mm -hmm. So even though you know I can write, but at the end, I, I mean, for my last step, I will copy what I write into Google Translate and translate into my first language to double check that whether or not my main like idea has been you know written correctly or accurately yes. to do a proofreading. That's great. Yeah, thank you. I think proofreading is also it's a good good tool for proofreading. And uh, recently, actually, I was invited to a uh, an event hosted by a Polish office in Taipei, uh, the yeah Poland Poland Taipei Ban Shi Chu. And um, yeah, one of my friends worked there, and she invited me to an event, a concert there. And I actually learned some Polish through the event. And when I'm home, I use Google Translate to double check those words and those meanings. And I learned the uh, uh, in Polish, if you say thank you, it's dziękuję. Dziękuję. Have you heard that? Dziękuję. Is it right? Yeah, I think it's it's uh, that amazing. And now Polish Taipei office are also trying their best to help, I mean, to help promoting them, their culture and language in Taiwan. So this year for the Taipei International Book Exhibition, uh, Poland office is one of the honor of guests of honor in, in Taiwan. Yeah, and they, they did it so well. They invited many writers and artists and musicians from Poland to Taiwan. And some of them came here for the first time. And it, it, it's really touching that they're also promoting Poland, but they're also asking everybody to support Ukraine because Ukraine is one of their good neighbor, good friends, and um, they have a deep connection uh, with each other. So some maybe some Ukraine people, they're family or their relatives are from Poland. So um, they even invited a band that is uh, that has four musicians, um, two Polish artists and two from Ukraine. And yeah, I, I'm, I'm really, I was touched by how they, you know, they're trying to help Ukraine because um, I think their language and culture are really closely related, right? Yeah, and I also met some friends from Switzerland too. They were there to help and support Ukraine, yeah. Very, um, yeah. And now I think Taiwan plays an important part in this international, um, you know, chaos because I, I think Taiwan is the true democratic country in Asia, right? Yeah. And, and you're, you, I think you can agree more. And um, actually, there's some someone who wants to threaten us and bully us. Uh, you know, they they send messages every day to the world to Taiwan. Mm -hmm. But still, I think. Taiwan people are, I mean, for the younger generation, we need to stay strong, stay tough, and we need to believe in ourselves and also believe in the value that um, that is better for our society, for our future generation. And you're here because you, you're also very interested in education. And I always think education is, is our future hope. It's the seeds for our future. So. I appreciate your effort here and thank you for choosing NTUE. <laughs> okay. <laughs> yeah, but but still I think our university, um, yeah, we we are actually one of the center for the teacher training and for nowadays also bilingual training and teacher education. So I, I think we place an important role and we need to be better for our kids, be our for our future, right? So yeah, I, I think um 
you know, um, Taiwan plays an important part now. And I think we receive much attention from the world now because of our special status. And I think it's not a bad thing at all. It's a bad thing. It's um, I think we can turn that into some positive motivation. Okay, all right. So just uh, some encouragement to you guys. You have you should have faith in your country. Okay, all right. And uh, how about this one, Elvish? Have you seen this movie? I love this movie. Yeah, Lord of the Rings. How many of you have seen this movie? Yay! And novel? Yeah. Okay, great. Okay, Joanne, I can tell you are smiling in your eyes. Okay. <laughs> All right, Joanne. So, what is Elvish here? What does that mean? And you say Elvish translators. <laughs> what is I that? Haven't used this before. You haven't used this. I haven't used it either. But there's a language in this movie. Just talking about translating. Oh. El Elvish language, yeah, that's right, that's right. So who is her? Can you tell everybody who's this beautiful fairy here? The king's um, in a high place. Yes, is uh, she the, the god, the elf? Uh, the, she's the queen. She's the queen, queen, queen of the elves, right? Yeah. Queen of the elves. And she's Kate, Kate Blanche? Yeah. yeah, yeah, Kate Blanche, yeah, so beautiful. Okay, so why is Elvish important here? So can you speak Elvish? Okay, okay. No, no, I, I can't either. <laughs> it's so difficult and it's actually very innovative because it's a language invented by linguists in this movie and in this epic novel. It's it's totally new and it's um, invented by the the author of Lord of the Rings. So actually linguists can invent new languages and it has its own grammar, own semantics, syntax, everything. So um yeah, so this is very amazing, right? Elvish language. And this is also a cool guy here, uh one of the elves. Remember him? Yes. Yeah. Is he hot? Yeah. <laughs> but I prefer uh he goes to say nigga. Aragorn! I like Aragorn more, but, but this is Elvish language, so we have to put in here. And um, yeah, actually the languages they speak and they use in this movie, Elvish language, it really exists in the movie. And also some huge fans of Lord of the Rings, they even have an Elvish club or they, they speak Elvish to each other. And can, you can learn that language. Like Harry Potter, they have um, their stuff. Yes, yes. Yeah. That's right. For J.K. Rowling, I mean, J.K. Rowling also invented many new Latin. Latin, yeah, and that used Latin, and she invented many new use of language in her magic spells. So she composed those words, and it, it has never existed in English, but she tried to invent new language in Harry Potter too. That's a very good example. Thank you. So isn't it cool? Okay, new language. So linguistics is the study of language. So if people ask you, okay, so you're learning linguistics now, so are you learning any language? Okay, you can tell them I'm learning the language, the study of language, not just, uh, you know, English, Japanese, Korean, or any language. It's the study of language, and it includes world languages. We're interested in knowing the pattern, the, you know, general pattern, and also the specific things in those languages. All right, so why should we study linguistics? Okay, I think the first one I want to change with you, because it can change your life. And it's the course that changed my life. Okay, that's why I'm here, right? <laughs> okay, so... Actually, you know, when I was a, a sophomore at, at NTU, which is next to our campus, um, I, I was in a department of foreign language and literature. But my department, they value literature more. So there's only one, I think one semester, I can take uh, linguistics. And during that course, I found it fascinating because my professor, she's very encouraging and friendly and she didn't get those low grades like the literature <laughs> professor did. <laughs> they also literature professor. They're so, you know, they, they, they talk about everything in class. They give lectures, but we don't know what to write in our essays because there are no clues. They, they're like fairies or someone, and I don't know what to write in my essay. And I, I got really, you know, disappointed grades, but still I passed. So when I was taking linguistics, it's opened a new window to me. And I, I think, wow, it's fascinating because I love English when I, was, when I was a little girl. I love learning languages. I learned Japanese, learned French. And, and I never knew that I can study language like this. So, um, you know, uh, starting from the second year of college, I decided, okay, I want to study linguistics. <laughs> it's a bit nerdy because some of my classmates, they still don't like this field a lot. So 
they said, really, are you sure? And yeah, some of my classmates even failed this um, course, but I got past and I got high grades and I think, oh my God, I, I think I have passion in it and I wanna pursue my further studies in it. And yeah, so that's, uh, you know, I, I really appreciate that course. It helps me, um, you know, learn a lot and inspire me to pursue my dreams. And then, you know, uh, during my third year and fourth year in college, um, I, in university, I went to the library, uh, NTU library, strongly recommend. You can go there with the, uh, you know, we have a, we have a contract with NTU, so you can borrow, you can use a ID to the library here, NTU, and you can ask them to give you a, a ID to go to NTU library. It's it's actually I think there are some like twenty or thirty ID you can borrow so you can ask them and you can go there for a walk. It's just within walking distance, right? Or bike you can bike or walk there. And I went to the library and I I I literally borrowed all the books related to linguistics study. And um, I have a great tu uh, I mean tutor. He's uh, one of my Shri Chang, and he encouraged me and he gave me a book list, said these are the must reads. And then I went there and read, read and I feel that, you know, that's the best memories I have in the library. I have so many books every day and I just enjoy it. And it's so nerdy, but so happy every day. <laughs> <laughs> I, ever, I, I even read one of the book written by my, by my uh, advisors. She's also from the Graduate Institute of Linguistics in NTU. And I read her book and I think I, I read it and I said, I want to be like her. Okay. So, yeah. So it's very inspiring that linguistics helped me, um, you know, change my life and help me find my, where my passion is. And actually, I think linguists focus on describing facts and analyzing patterns. That's very fascinating because you, you think about language as something you use, something maybe a little bit abstract, but actually for language, there are facts, there are linguistic patterns, like what we just discussed, there are word order, grammatical patterns, categories. And linguists love to analyze and categorize those patterns. And through analysis of those you know, patterns, you would actually find that people use different language. Sometimes we categorize things differently, like for uh, German speakers. German speakers, I think uh, there's, um, the, the noun and verbs, there's the, uh, the masculine and feminine, uh, the category of the nouns and verbs, right? Okay, can you give me an example? Like, for example, what is the gender of this? I mean, the gender, uh, it's neutral, right? This one's neutral. No? Male? This one's male. Table is male. Okay, how about the pen? Male? Okay, who's female? <laughs> Water bottle? The lamp is female. Okay, the lamp is female. Uh, the bottle is female. Yeah, I think this is female. No, okay. So, do you, I mean, when you learn this as a little girl, do you have questions or you just learn it unconsciously? You acquire it from your, unconsciously, right? You just take it for granted, like, okay, this is male, this is female. Okay, so how about in Chinese? How do we classify nouns? We don't use gender, we don't use male or female. But when we call this, we will say, this is uh, What is the classifier you use to describe this? This is a bottle of water or um you know a water bottle. So we call we, we use really you know detailed categories of each noun. So in English it's like uh or you know countable, uncountable, but in Chinese we have so many classifiers. But if there are two eyes, it's 一双眼睛, a pair of eyes. Okay, 一双眼睛. 然后这个是一根头发, right? So in Chinese, we have a detailed classifiers. And for a horse, how do you call a horse? 一匹马, 一匹马. 那狗呢? 狗, dog. 一条狗, 一只狗, 都可以, right? For the dog. Yeah, and we have actually different classifiers for animals, too. So, yeah, I think it's a little bit like, I mean, English, there's also some classifier that's a little bit similar, but not so many as we have in Chinese. So that's how we classify nouns. 
And in European language, there's lots of masculine, feminine, and neutral use. Mm -hmm. And in English, usually for now, it's about countable or uncountable or mass nouns, right? So that's very different in how people category things, the patterns. Okay, and second thing about why you need to learn linguistic is that you can view things from different perspectives and see things in a new way. So while learning these languages and you study the language, you will find that actually um, you know, people using different language, they view things from different perspectives. Yeah. Like it's still the same world, but you're just trying to view it or, you know, understand it through different angles, through different perspectives. Okay, so let's talk about color. You know, you learn colors from, from a very early age. You can see color, the visual image, but do you know that there are like a hundreds, hundreds of categories of whiteness of snow in in, in the uh, igloo, I mean, for the, uh, what what is that? Uh, igloos, Eskimos, yeah, Eskimos. Okay, so for Eskimos in their language, there are hundreds of categories describing the snow, different status of snow, different status of whiteness. But that does not exist in our language because we don't have snow here. Um, yeah, we have it in the mountains, but not many, yeah. And I think in Korea, it's snowing now, right? Is it snowing? Not much? I don't know because I'm from the south. south. Oh, okay. Uh, Maybe the northern part is yeah. snowing, right? And how about in Switzerland? Snowing, yeah. yeah. And I know the sports, I mean, for the sports in Switzerland, winter sports, um, the snowing, uh, I mean, the sledding or the skating is very important, right? So there are many verbs, nouns using to describe those sports. And how about in the U.S. where you're from? Uh, I it's snowing too? Okay, great, great. It's beautiful mountain area, right? Okay, so um, yeah, so actually, you know, you will view things from different perspectives through languages, and it actually reflected in language linguistic evidence. Okay, so linguists are interested in exploring reasons and possible answers, okay? And I think that's really cool and fascinating. All right, and this is a pie chart I want to share with you. And actually, I tried to we tried to include some of the uh, main subfields of linguistics. So here we have phonetics and phonology, which is about the sound, the articulation, how you produce, how you um, you know process, perceive the sounds, and produce those sounds. Phonology and phonetics, and also a very important one we were going to talk next week is morphology. Morphology is about how you compose words, so like building blocks, like Legos. How many of you have played Lego when you're a little kid? Or maybe some of you are still playing now, right? It's, 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 yeah. it's really, um, I mean, it's also for uh, like uh, yeah, adults like and months. really huge ones and yeah. you can build it for weeks, for months and so expensive. <laughs> My sons love Legos, so I know. Yeah, I invested a lot in that. <laughs> Morphology is like the building blocks, the Legos that combine those words. So you can decompose the words when you're learning morphology. And like when you're learning English, there you learn past tense, you learn that ED is the past tense, usually the normal past tense you need to add, but still there are some exceptions, right? So for morphology um, in Chinese, you will learn that um, in Chinese, uh, what would you do when you are saying something that ha has happened? What word would you use when you say something has happened? Okay, Michelle, I will ask you. Yes, Okay, when they say chula means I have eaten my breakfast. I had it. Okay, lo. Okay, have you come to Taiwan yet? Lo is the marker that we use to mark that we have done this, we have done that, okay? So there are different uh, way of uh, you combine the words to uh, use in, as a past tense or in a different, um, you know, to express different meanings. And for syntax, actually, syntax is where it's actually, it means the satisfactory pattern, like what we just discussed, the word order, like SVO, SLV, or VO, so the word order, or also the grammatical category that you use every day, noun, verb, adjective, you know, that's how you categorize the word in grammar. So that's about, that's syntax. And actually syntax is a very, very important field in linguistics. Uh, we will talk about that later. And, you know, actually in uh, MIT in the US, syntax is one of the most important field in linguistics because linguists there, they would try to 
analyze the syntax from every language, like they're uh, solving the math problems and drawing tree structures, you know, diagrams, and they, those those linguists are really cool. I'm going to introduce you one very uh, just later, very soon. All right, for semantics, it's about the meaning, the meaning of words, semantics, okay, the meaning of words. So we will talk about the semantic meanings. So, um, you know, when you tell somebody a lie, what does that mean? Okay, what's the meaning of the lie? Is something true or false? Okay, that's what semantics are concerning about. Okay, let's move on to pragmatics. Pragmatics is closely related to semantics because it's about meaning, but it's also about how you use language every day. So um, for pragmatics, sometimes I would say, it's a little bit cold here. And then when I look at Steve, I said, it's a little bit cold here. What would Steve do? What would you do? Okay, if your girlfriend sitting next to you is saying, oh, I'm cold, Steve, what would you do? <laughs> Okay, put a, oh, that's sweet, put a jacket in <laughs> Will you take off yours and put it on for her? Oh, that's sweet. And what would you do, Kevin? I mean, someone asked you, okay, Steve. Steve said he's cool, what would you do? I feel bad, too. <laughs> <laughs> would, you, would you turn the, I mean, close the window for him? Maybe, yeah, okay. That's pragmatics. Pragmatics, you know, once my students from P department, he said, Pragmatics is about something you didn't say that you want people to do. Okay, that's how you use language to make things happen. Okay, so when Steve said, I'm cold, uh, okay, I'm cold, uh, Kevin, don't you think so? Okay, maybe Kevin would stand up and close the window for him, and that's how pragmatics work. Okay, so um, be careful because when you're having a relationship, pragmatics very important. Try to bring the meanings and how people use language. Sometimes, you know, there's a story uh, my my uh, my class, my student just shared with me. He said he asked his girlfriend every day, "What do you want to eat?" And she said, "Oh, everything. Oh, nothing. I uh, everything. Anything you like, but anything you like." It's actually a trap. Yeah. <laughs> anything you like is anything trap. <laughs> but you have to read those messages and say, oh, okay, yeah, we'll go to either. Well, so you have to, you know, decode those messages. That's how you use language. And for social linguistics, it's about language and culture, language and gender, about the society. So, you know, there, there are language and power too. You Sometimes you use language differently when you're using it with your friends, when, when you talk to the teacher or talk to some your parents or someone some elderly people, you would use different forms of language. And that's how uh, social linguistics, they, they concern about how you use language for different social groups and for different gender or for, you know, um, uh, social functions, okay? All right, how about purpose linguistics, computational linguistics? Actually, these two fields are very, very important and popular nowadays, widely used. Um, as we mentioned, corpus. Corpus is actually a database that include the language, the collocations, how we use language. And um, actually, Google is a, it, it's a it's a great example of corpus, corpus linguistics. So you can search for the keyword there and you can search for how, um, you know, for the keyword, you can search how it is used in different sentences. So the corpus linguistics is actually um, very related to computational linguistics. OK, so um, for computational linguists, they actually learn how to write the codings and how to, um, you know, design and to uh, invent the codings for the language. Okay. And for cognitive linguistics, actually, this is also one of my majors. Cognitive linguistics has concern about the uh, interrelationship between language and brain, about how you think. Okay. So we believe for a cognitive linguist, we believe. Language reflects what you think and how you think. And actually, um, you know, it is related to your brain. And we will also, for the for the cognitive linguist, linguists, they will look into the brain through MRI or some very important experiment and scanning. They will check what happened to the brain if you're using this language or you're lying or you're using a metaphor or something. So cognitive linguistics is very important for, um, you know, uh, language also acquisition in children, okay? So let's move on to language acquisition and second language acquisition. This is uh, the study of how you acquire language. So you have actually, you are all, um, you know, at least you're bilinguals, I guess, Bil monolingual, bilingual, or multilingual. So 
Monolingual means you can only speak one language. Bilingual means you can, means you can speak two languages. And multilingual means you can speak more than three languages, right? Three or more. So for a language acquisition, actually, usually concerned about the first language, how you acquire your first language. Okay, so what's your first language? I think most of you, uh, so Mandarin Chinese, right? And Korean, right? And Mandarin Chinese, am I right? Joanne, is Mandarin Chinese your first language? Not actually, right? Because you are when you're little, you study. You, you were in South Africa, right? So, what's your first language? Maybe bilingual. This should be Chinese. Uh, Mandarin more. Mandarin more. Mandarin yeah, because my parents both speak Mandarin. Okay, great, great. At home. Oh, okay. So Mandarin Chinese still mother tongue, right? Mother tongue. But maybe uh, starting from the early education, you start to learn English. Yeah and more british english right okay great so uh this is this is what we call second language acquisition so uh, for joanne's case when she's living in south africa she started to learn english around four or five or three Maybe even younger because i had a nanny oh you had a nanny and she speaks english yeah. to you okay so that's uh how she acquired the second language there but for people maybe you would uh, for most people you would actually acquire second language from different age you know through your life and there's also a very famous hypothesis which is called the critical age hypothesis which is around the puberty 13 and those um, according to critical age hypothesis it proposed that if you learn the language before 13 the pronunciation always seems better. You know, you will learn the pronunciation well. However, if it's after 13, don't worry, you can still learn the grammar, syntax, semantics, grammatics, morphology. You can learn this part, but for the phonology of phonetics, maybe the better age is to learn it before 13. That's, um, you know, a hypothesis, critical age hypothesis from language acquisition. Do you agree on that? Uh huh. Well, it's a, it's there, there are debates on it. Okay. So, it's about how, um, I mean, how young when you're learning English? How old were you? Uh, 13. 13? Oh, 13. Wow. Okay. So um, before that, have you learned any other language? What's your first language? My first language was Swiss German. Oh, Swiss German. German. Yes, German, so, Swiss German. Then in kindergarten, I learned the real German. <laughs> oh, okay. <laughs> Swiss German first, because from your parents, it's Swiss German. Yes. And then kindergarten, the... German, yeah. Right, <laughs> grade five is French. Oh, grade five, French. And then grade? Grade seven, English. Oh, grade seven, English. Wow, that's multilingual in Switzerland. Yeah, I think in Switzerland, they, I mean, usually children don't start to learn English as their second language. I mean, not the first, maybe it depends on the region and the schools, right? Yeah, okay, thank you. So, April, how many languages have you learned? First language? English, um, and is there any second language courses or learning? I haven't learned any courses, but I do have like a lot of Spanish. Oh, Spanish, Spanish at school? No, at home. Oh, tutor. Oh, Spanish, yeah. Spanish is also one of the most popular second language uh, in the U.S., right? I mean, many children will start to learn Spanish, especially when you met Dylan, he will share with you. In California, like uh, all the Spanish uh, courses, Spanish classes are full and very popular there. And um, yeah, and now you guys are learning Mandarin Chinese too, right? That's not you. So you, you, your high school offered um sorry your high school offered the uh, second language course in Chinese. Wow. I'm not that good. <laughs> okay, test her. Okay. <laughs> I think Taiwan is the best place to learn Chinese because we teach traditional Chinese, the most beautiful characters and beautiful system. And actually, if you can read traditional Chinese, to read simplified Chinese. No, but piece of cake. Makes it hard for um, me and my like American uh, <laughs> classic uh -huh. because in America, if you learn Chinese, it's always just like, oh, 
I know you have pinyin, right? The the romanization. Yeah, pinyin system is actually easier and more friendly for um you know for English speakers because the alphabet. Yeah, mm -hmm. but still don't. Worry, but I think you don't need to worry. Just um yeah. I know it's it's hard at first. That's true. Yeah, Emily. So uh, we provide also uh, traditional Chinese teaching here because I thought uh, here in here we also teach simplified. Mm -hmm. Chinese. Um, the teaching materials may be a little bit different, right? Yeah, but do they also teach painting here? I don't know yet. You don't know yet? <laughs> yeah, she's just here. Yeah, the teaching materials provided by Chinese uh, language center uh, on the second floor may you know, differ depend on the teacher. Um, Mr. Kim, are you also learning ch Chinese now? Yes. In our uh, Chinese center? No. Started March. Oh, started March. Okay, great, great. Uh, is it also in somewhere nearby? No, oh, it was started in March. Yes. Okay, okay, so let us know how it works. Yeah, so you know Chinese, right? Study a little bit before. Um, Yes. Yes. Okay. But it's never too late. It's never too, I mean, you can always learn a new language at different ages. So that's great. Since you're here, you know, take the opportunity to learn Chinese and use it. And you will actually, it's a precious experience for you because many people said Chinese is a very difficult language to learn. So it's great that you take, um, you know, you try it and step out of your comfort zone, take the challenge, okay? All right, how about psycholinguistics and neurolinguistics? Psycholinguistics is about also the study of the psychology of linguistics. So um, for psycholinguistics and neurolinguistics, it's about the brain, and they would do many psychological experiments, psycholinguistic experiments to, to learn, uh, to test how people acquire language and how they use it, how they, you know, um, actually how it related to your brain and also some brain damage. You know, there are many uh, experiments and studies on that. So this is, I think this is just the main uh, core areas of studies of uh, intro to linguistics, but still there are many uh, subfields um, that can be uh, divided into, divided from each subfield, okay? All right, so um, let's move on to the next one. Okay, so now I'm going to introduce you this guy, so Square. He's a father of modern linguistics, someone you need to know in the first class of linguistics. Okay, so um, I'm going to ask you to check and um, know more about these guys. So I'm going to introduce you the keywords first because this is the homework for you uh, for this week. Check out who Saussure is and what he did. And he's the father of modern linguistics. So why is he so important? Okay, check it out. And I will ask you to share your findings with us on the online discussion group um, on iMagic platform. Okay, iMagic. So maybe uh, for a group, Huapao group, you can also tell April and keep her updated what iMagic is and help her with that. Okay, so you will, it's very easy and friendly platform for um, students, you can just submit it online. Okay, it's an online platform. Okay, so for Sister, the very important thing is that uh, he mentioned that he noticed and he discovered the linguistic system as a series of differences of sound combined with a series of differences of ideas. Okay, you may say, okay, we know, yeah, sounds and ideas. And so what's so special about it? Actually, Sister point out the important system, important correlation between the sounds and ideas. For example, um, you will actually see that um, the, the most famous example is the example cat. So cat there, uh, in English we call it cat. How do we call it in Chinese? Mao, 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 Mi, in German. Similar to cat, cat in Korean. <laughs> <laughs> Sounds uh, yeah. very complicated. Puyamo? Puyamo. Oh, yes, a cook I told it. Koyami, cat. Um, how about Japanese? Nico, Nico, yeah, yeah. So, actually, this is the signifier. You can see signifier, the sound different in every language. However, the thing we refer to the idea that the cat that animal there is the signified okay so so Sir find out that the sound image and the concept there the relationship the connection 
between the signifier and the signified is arbitrary. What is arbitrary? Arbitrary means, you know, it's just there. You, you, you cannot explain it or you cannot say why. Why is you call it katsu? Why you call it cat? Why you call it mommy? It's arbitrary in the language. That's why you need to learn it, right? So it, it, there's no meaning. It's just arbitrary. And that's a very important statement of the linguistic system. You know, this is arbitrary. So you have to learn it. You have to memorize it. So you know how to call it in that language. Okay. All right. Now let's move on to the next one. Okay, this guy is also very important, Noam Chomsky. How many of you have heard him or? Yeah, Chomsky. Okay, April, can you share your understand, have your basic understanding of Chomsky? How, you, how do you know him? Oh, really? It's okay? Okay, great, great. The father of something, but... <laughs> I think I'm going to say he's the godfather, okay? Okay. Godfather and father of formal linguistics. And you're right. I like it. Yeah, I think you, you really took linguistics before. Chomsky <laughs> is the father of formal linguistics. He's the godfather. And he's still there. And sometimes he wrote many critics to criticize U.S. government. He's very active and, you know, critical, cynical. So he uh, actually, he's the one. And, you know, I really admire when I'm reading those books and those linguistic theory because he is the one who found out language is a process of free creation. And he also pointed out the laws and principles are, you know, in language languages are fixed, but the manner in which the principles of generation are used is free. So with the fixed principle and um, gener uh, fixed principles and laws of language, there are still free um, creations, free uh, creations and infinitely varied um, principles that are created from those fixed principles. That's a fascinating thing about language. So language can be productive language can change and language can be creative and innovative in many ways. Even the interpretation and use of words involves a process of free creation, okay? So Noam Chomsky has also claimed many, many important things in syntax. I think he's the father of syntax. <laughs> I would say, yeah, I think you, that's maybe your professor are telling you. And the for formal linguistics, they concern about syntax. They think syntax is the most important field in linguistics. And um, you will find out that when we talk about syntax, because he is also the professor in MIT, and he tried to actually understand and analyze those linguistic patterns, the grammatical sentence patterns, uh, like solving the math questions. Like the equation and also the rules, as you see, the rules, the laws, the principles of language. Okay, he tried to find out those rules that govern the use of language. Okay, so, okay, so that's about Noam Chomsky. And this is one of my favorite quotes from Noam Chomsky, but still he has many of them. And I, I like how he actually, he is very um, active in not just linguistics, but he also concerns about uh, the politics and the society in the U.S. And I think as a scholar, as a professor, you should not just, you know, stay in the lab or just concerned about your research, but you should actually show your care and contribute to the society. And that's what I love about him. Okay. All right. Next, also one of my favorite scholars, George Lakoff. I've actually met him uh, when I was in uh, UC Berkeley before. He's a professor from UC Berkeley. And actually, you can see Noam Chomsky is from MIT, so he's on the East Coast, East Coast of the US. And this guy, uh, George Lakoff, he's from in the West. So this is the father of the West. <laughs> <laughs> Like the rappers, you know, East and West. Okay, so in the West, in UC Berkeley, they concern about the cognitive linguistics. They think they they, they are also, um, you know, they love Chomsky, but they think, okay, you talk about syntax and you think, uh, you know, the language can be rule governed, they're formal linguistics, but we, we want to know how people really think um, through language, how language can reflect people think. So they are more concerned about the cognitive linguistics, the, the relationship between language and cognition, and also the function of those languages. They think the formality, the forms, the sentence patterns is there, yeah. But how about the functions? How about the usage? So they're very interested in the cognition, the cogn cognitive functions of language. And 
that's why he has also written this book with uh, Mark Turner on a uh, Mark uh, with Mark, another scholar on metaphors we live by. And in this book, he actually claimed that you are using metaphor every day. For example, a very important one, time is money. Okay, do you actually use this metaphor to live every day? Okay, time is money. So um, how do you come here today? I mean, how do you come to NTUE today? How many of you are taking a bus? Bus, okay, take a taxi. Nobody? Okay, too expensive, right? Okay, and um, how many of you just walk here? Walk here. Yay, okay. Yeah, yeah okay, you're living in the dorm. <laughs> okay, so um, actually, I'm talking about transportation here because if you're going to Kaohsiung, okay, for example, you're going to Kaohsiung. In Taiwan, you can take the high speed railway. Okay, must try. Very good, convenient, fast, but it's a little bit more expensive than the bus, than the train. The high speed railway is faster and, you know, very convenient. So the ticket is more expensive. However, you would take the bus all the way down, maybe. Um, um, yeah. How, how much is it? Mm -hmm. Probably much cheaper, eight. right? Okay. So uh, what would what would you take? Bus or high speed railway? High speed, high speed railway. Okay. All right. So you sometimes you make a choice based on this matter for time is money. And Sometimes you talk to your friend, you, you said, I've invested a lot of time in this in this guy. Okay, I've invested my chin, my youth in this guy. <laughs> okay, you're using the concept of time is money. And actually, I would say, okay, uh, when I look at my watch, I say, you know what? You know, um, one second cost me like ten thousand or a hundred thousand dollars. Come on, quick, tell me what are you thinking? Okay, for the invest invest uh, investors or the bankers, they would say that because their time is precious because they're making money every second. Okay, so time is money is also one of the metaphors we live by, and there's still lots of lots of that. And you know, in my course, I always say, welcome to the journey of linguistics. So the journey there is also a metaphor. It, it actually conceptualized the process, the experience that you're going to take during this semester. So if you have an interest in this book, I strongly recommend it. It's a good book of knowing not cognitive linguistics. And you will find that you're using metaphor and think with metaphors every day. It's in our language. Okay. And um, as a future English educator, okay, I mean, most of you are aiming to become a future English educator in Taiwan. So I think linguistics is a useful tool for you to understand, to help us understand how language works and how language is used. You have mentioned that and your answer is very good. And also it helps you to approach the study of language scientifically scientifically and to describe those back and patterns. And linguistics provide good practice for critical thinking and analytic skills. I think that's very, very helpful. And it's also the bridge to connect teachers and students during the language learning process. Oh, so I hope that while learning this, you can help your children, help your students to connect with you and to understand why you're teaching this, why you're teaching the grammar, why you're teaching them how to use the language because um, you're helping them, right? And linguistics can be the bridge to connect you to. And linguistics is also a door to interdisciplinary studies, and I hope it can open a bigger world for all of you. Okay, that's my hope and goals. All right, so anything you want to add on here as a future English educator? Okay, you can think about it, all right? And now let's check this. Um, so for the extensions, what do, what do I mean when I'm saying interdisciplinary research? I mean, you can also apply linguistics in many, many different fields, including we just mentioned data science, AI, politics and law. Yeah, actually, you know, for the U.S. president, for their great presidential speech, for President Obama, they even actually, they will have some consultants with the linguists to make sure their speech is powerful, they use every word perfectly, you know. Actually, linguists can actually co-work with politics and politicians. And I, I have to say now, I'm, I'm following our President Tsai's uh, fan page on Facebook, and I noticed that people told me that our President Tsai Ing-wen, she also, she's also concerned about every word and every public speech she's giving. So all the text, all the speech that she's giving, she will also 
uh, checked very thoroughly with the linguists, with the language experts to make sure every word, each word that she's, you know, um, sharing with everyone is accurate and without any problem. Okay, so politics and law also for the lawyers. You know what? Actually, many, many lawyers in the U.S., they started learning linguistics and they were undergrad because the use of language in the contract in the court can actually change many things, you know? So for a lawyer, it can be very important. Linguistics can be very important too. How about anthropology? How about cultural studies, what's in the neurology and psychology, psychology and education? Now I'm gonna leave this to you. I want you to chat with your friends and um, for each group, I will assign a interdisciplinary study. So for you guys, I'm gonna ask you to talk about how linguistics can be combined in anthropology. And for you guys who talk about cultural studies, culture and multimodality. Okay, for you guys, mocha, mocha and multimodality. <laughs> yeah, very catchy. Very and neurology about the brain. How does it, um, you know, can be interrelated to the brain studies in neurology. And um, for Hua Baozu, can you talk about the psychology? Uh, education, okay, education for your group, education. We talked about this previously. How can it be applied in education linguistics, okay? All right, so let's take a break while you're having a discussion with your friends. Let me see what time is it now. Okay, it's almost 11, so we'll take a break. And then when we're back after 10 minutes, I think Dylan will be arriving very soon, and we're going to have our session on group discussion, okay? All right, let's take a break. Yeah, you need a break.
同学。Jenny， 今天今天你们一起来，我们香港讲，也是一种一九一八。
And I am actually recording now, so All please right. help me um, stop recording. And this is a small child that's a group for Joanne, uh, Lu Ling, Guan Xing, their group one. Okay. And for Jenny's group, Jenny, I love the names. Adam, they have a very cool name, Winnie and uh, Jenny, Winnie, Adam. Can I ask you, is this a mocha, mocha, cafe, or matcha? Matcha. Matcha. Or pizza. Matcha. Yeah. Matcha. 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 Yeah. Edwin, can you remind your name, the group name again? I'm telling Dylan. I P S L. 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 Grad student from our department. Awesome. Yeah. Okay, so Motala Tree, I will tell TPK, and Wabao Awesome. Okay, so these groups are asked each group to present their no discussion. Cool. Yeah. 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 You can talk about this for them because of the language invention. We talk about some drama. Okay. Yeah, you can just share this with them. And also Yoda. And then there's also three questions. You still have time. You can go through this. Okay. Okay. So okay. I sent you an email responding to you. I just want to know how briefly that I want to talk about what you do today. English. English. Yeah, so um, we'll look over at this three different box. Yeah, so I, I'm just going to open it with it today and see what you think. So, all right, everyone. Now we're ready. Are you ready for the next session with Dylan? Okay, let's welcome her. Okay, this is her. Yeah, some of you may have met her before. Some of you haven't. And this is our awesome. Okay, T.A. Okay, yeah, Dylan. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, okay. <laughs> yeah, okay, so uh, he will be leading the group discussion with you for this session, and I I'll be leaving for another meeting. I'm so sorry there's some schedule conflict. So please, uh, I will pass it to Dylan, and please enjoy your discussion with Dylan. Okay, thank you. Thanks for saving. Thank you. All right, see you next week, everyone. Hi, yes, I got married. <laughs> yes, over the winter over the winter break, I got married to my previous girlfriend, Emily. Previous girlfriend. We didn't break up, we we progressed. <laughs> Yeah, she actually was here just yesterday. So for those who don't know me, I've, I've been here a couple of years now. Uh, my name is Dylan Bird, Tan Um I'm uh, <laughs> my, my legal name now. I had, I had, to, I had to register. I, if you're interested, I'll tell you more later. I had to register a legal Chinese name in order to get married here in Taiwan. And so now, now in Taiwan, I'm not even Dylan anymore. I said, oh. <laughs> We don't normally say our Can you say again? Sure. I can write it on the board. Yeah. Not long. Not long. No problem. <laughs> so yeah, just briefly, if you don't know who I am, I'm a grad student just like you guys. I'm in my second year. Um, just yesterday was my final research um, presentation. So it's been accepted. My proposal has been accepted, which means I can now thank you. So stressful. You go in there and it's like they have questions for you. 
and they're critical. And it's like, oh no, I thought we were friends. <laughs> I guess actually we are friends. It's just their job. So it's going very well for me. This is my last semester here at NCUE, and I've been helping Tiffany with her classes for about one year now, um, on and off. I've been her TA, and I'm continuing this semester, and I'm very happy to do it because I studied linguistics in my undergrad. And so being able to expand my knowledge a little bit further by attending her classes and assisting is really cool for me. I think linguistics is really cool. And um, as part of it, of course, I learned Chinese. So I, I tell you this because we're all learning together. I've taken this course before <laughs> because I'm TA. But still, we're all students together and we're all learning together. So she says I'm cool and I appreciate that. But I'm not, I'm not a real teacher. You know, we're all students together. And I hope that I can learn from you just like you're learning from me and from Professor Lin. Um, so she assigned you guys a project, right? Designed us into groups and then asked us to present. Uh, why don't we get into that? I'm looking forward to see what you guys have. Um, do you want to go just numerically, starting with group one, or do you want to like rock, paper, scissors this out or something? Uh, you're wrong about that. I'm so sorry. Uh, matcha latte is group one. <laughs> matcha latte, you guys ready? All right, please. Talk about well, yeah. <laughs> All right. So yeah, we are thinking about the correlation between um, multimodality and linguistics. Mm -hmm. So we have to define what is multimodality, right? All right. So multimodality, according to our research, is means the different ways of expressing things, meanings, or messages. So no, no matter it's you know visual, uh, oral, or oral or physical or spatial. And that reminds me of the features of linguistic that Professor Lane just mentioned earlier in this class, that linguistic includes different aspects that we can talk about. For example, we can talk about form, morph uh, morphology, we can talk about sound, uh, phonology, we can talk about uh, the order of the language, uh, syntax, right? Mm -hmm. So I think like linguistic is, you know, we can talk about that multiple so i think that has something to do with multimodality all right thank you very much it definitely does could you give an example of a multimodal form of communication so for example as a teacher in the future if we want to uh, like express i mean if you want to teach cat cat right mm -hmm. so we have the uh the the signified meaning there right cat. but as a teacher in the elementary level classroom uh, in addition to only use, you know, oral or spoken language for students to mm -hmm. learn, that, that that's too abstract for them. Mm -hmm. So we can use different, like we like different media. Like we show the flash car in which we can see a, an image of a cat. We can, we can, you know, we can, we can use this to express. Okay, cat, you know, you you see cat in your daily life, mm -hmm. you know, it's you. And we can maybe we can make this sound like meow as cats. Yeah. So I think that's kind of the idea of you know to use the idea of multimodality linguistically to teach. It definitely is. That's an excellent example. So specifically in the field of linguistics, multimodal multimodal linguistics is using more than one method to communicate. Um, an example like a flashcard is excellent as a teacher. It's not really linguistics, but it's a good application of linguistics. Um, an example of multimodal linguistics would be, for example, someone who's gesturing along with their, their speech. And we can see how that changes with different cultures. I'm sure you can think of a few cultures that really like to gesture as they talk, and others that are very, yeah, exactly, <laughs> and others that are very reserved as they talk. And this is one level of multimodality that goes into the, link, the language and culture of a place, and it, it can get really deep, we chase it down. Excellent example. Um, group two was IPSL. The extremely confident group yeah, here. <laughs> so, mm, well, we are talking about cultural studies related to linguistics. Excellent. So, we just think of one example, which is the movie My Fair Lady. Mm. In the movie, uh, the actress uh, grown up in a rural area, so her accent is quite uh, bad or mm. not good. But as a linguist, the actor, he can try to identify the person where does he from or her from from her accent or his accent. So I think the cultural with uh, related to linguistics can somehow reflect on uh, their accents, so they can know where the person from 
by identifying with the accent. So cultural studies, uh, as we mentioned before, the cultural uh, can represent a country. So if we want to know some, uh, if we want to do some study about the cultural, we can start from their linguistics. Excellent, and it's definitely a good place to start. And to take it one step further, would you say that if you heard, let's say, a British accent, mm -hmm. a person speaking British English, yes. would you have any other thoughts about this person other than just they might be from Britain? What other kind of cultural baggage do you have with that accent? T. T. Okay. Gentleman. Uh, maybe a gentleman. All right, now we're talking. So <laughs> immediately, <laughs> immediately you think maybe that they're higher class, right? What else? Hmm? Queen. The queen. Okay. Rest in peace. <laughs> and the uh, um the suits. Suit. Ah, right. So the fashion style. Very nice. And, uh, cat. <laughs> the top hat. <laughs> so thank you for those examples. So this is an additional aspect of, of cultural studies that linguistics ties into. And I'll talk more about that in just a moment because I have an example of how study of linguistics led anthropologists studying culture to make a discovery about uh, young people on a certain island of America. Culture is, of course, not just where someone is from or what language they speak. It has an entire world attached to it based of perceptions and self-perceptions and how you can present yourself to other people. And all these things can be changed based upon a study of their linguistics and also can be assisted to be changed. For example, with Julie Roberts and My Fair Lady, yes. um, we can help someone either craft a new identity for themselves for a movie, or sometimes even as a politician or things. Uh, this is another area of, of linguistics that it, it interplays with itself. It's not just the study of culture. We can also use it to affect culture. Thank you. Uh, group three is DBK, Deb Kel Casey Barbie. Yes. <laughs> So uh, we are responsible for neurolinguistics. So I think it has to do with how language is presented in our brain. So uh, a very easy example is some people, they have stutter problem. So uh, they have some therapy that has to do with uh, like speech therapy and how to deal with stutter, how to speak fluently. That, that is an example uh, we found. And also, it's basically it's the study of brain and how brain will function when we when we talk and how the word movement and also they also study if people born with two language how they their brain different from only uh, people who only speak one language mm. yeah and then they also start uh, study about how we learn to talk again if we uh, have brain uh, injury, like we have a stroke and mm -hmm. we lose the uh, ability to talk or read. How can we uh, re take the the ability? Yeah. Excellent. So, what would you say would be an application of linguistic neurology? I think it would be like. Uh, like speech therapy, yeah, speech therapy. Good, good example. And hypnotherapy. Mm -hmm. yeah. Awesome. If you would like to see a movie that talks more about neuro neurolinguistics and specifically speech therapy, I can recommend this movie. It's called The King's Speech. Have, have you seen it before? Yeah. yeah, it's a good movie. It's all about King Edward, right before World War One, and as World War One was breaking out, um, he was the King of England, and he had a speech disability. And there was one linguist that the, the king's family hired to help him speak better so that he could he could speak on the radio to encourage his people and his troops. It's very interesting to think. The king's speech. Group four is papaya. Okay. So <laughs> we are on the discussion of linguistics and anthropology. Uh, from our understanding and some Little research anthropology is about uh, human development, maybe in socially, mm -hmm. uh, culturally, or even genetically. So uh, the connection between them is maybe in genetic, genetically, um, 
how would uh, the way our family or our ancestors speak the language influences how we speak the language right now? Uh, so maybe it's not just about our environment or our family uh, relative relationship, but also something in our genetic program. But uh, I also found something really interesting on the internet is that um, culturally or uh, pop culturally speaking, maybe um, if a group of people who are familiar with Broadway musicals, when they say, I love cats, uh, it's different from mm -hmm. our general understanding mm -hmm. of saying, I love the animal cat. Mm -hmm. So they're referring to the musical cat. So that's how anthropology would also have the uh, influence on human speaking because of the different area or region they come from and they got different information. That's why they speak differently. Excellent. Yeah. Very cool. So this is actually, I wanted to bring this up later, but I think it applies now. So the example that I wanted to bring up about cultural studies and linguistics and anthropology and linguistics, um, a number of years ago, there was a, a linguist who did a research in an island of Massachusetts. Uh, it's near Martha's Vineyard. I don't think it's actually Martha's Vineyard, but it's one of the islands off of Massachusetts. So Massachusetts, as you know, is a, is a prosperous state in America, usually very high income. City of Boston is there, old state, old money. Uh, they have their own accent compared to the rest of America. But these islands specifically have a further accent that's different from the rest of Massachusetts and the rest of America because no one really goes there. There's nothing to do on the islands. The only reason you live there is if you've lived there for 500 years, basically. So another thing about these islands is that they're not very developed, um, much like some of the islands of Taiwan. If you are born there and you want to go to university, there is no university on the island. You have to leave the island and go to mainland America and study there. So the linguist found an interesting development. Among the young people on the islands, the ones that did not plan to go to university had a very strong island accent. They're very, even sometimes stronger than their elders. But the ones that did plan to go to university didn't have nearly as strong an island accent. Sometimes they had just a, like a Boston accent, as if they were already in mainland America, even though they had never been there, or at least they had never spent much time there. So this linguist reported in his study that it had to do with their culture and had to do with their plans for the future. Without even thinking about it, these young people that planned to leave the island were already adopting a mainland American accent to distance themselves from the island. Whereas those that planned to stay on the island wanted to put down roots into their culture and were unconsciously adapting a thicker island accent. And I think that's really cool because it shows us one area we can use linguistics to understand a society better. And that has a role in any, any number of things. That allows a government to plan its economy better. That allows us to build proper infrastructure. It allows us to have outreach programs, all kinds of things. And it actually suggests a research project. Since we're all grad students now, I don't think any research has been done on this. But how many of us have been to Jinmen? Jinmen. You've been to Jinmen? What do you think? <laughs> Don't you feel that people in Tiananmen have a different accent from people in Taiwan? Okay. I've been there a few times, and from my impression, they did have a different accent from people in Taiwan. But I wasn't researching it, so I'm not quite certain. I wonder if a similar study was done in Jinmen among the young people, if they have a stronger Jinmen or Fujian accent, or a stronger Taiwan accent, and what that means for their plans for the future. Might be worth looking into. Who knows? Anyway, let's move on. We've got one more group that is Guo Baozu. <laughs> We're talking about linguistics applied in education, and we think like our this linguistic course, we learned about how language works and uh, how we apply the language. And as we want to be a future teacher, we can know more about language and help us teach the children, the students. Excellent. That's really good. How do you think you could apply that in a classroom? Mm, maybe we can uh, teach them um, the structure of the language, the syntax, the semantics, mm -hmm. like this. 
Nice. Even if you, I'm sorry, even if you didn't explicitly teach those things, do you think that knowing about those things would make you a better language teacher? I think so too. Yes, Isabel. Go ahead, yeah. Okay, so it's like a lot of what you're saying is like as a car, right? And the car wants to go here. Mm -hmm. You can, you can, it can either go this way or it can go this way. Right. right. So this one would be to run someone over. In mm -hmm. <laughs> German, that's the important. And this one would be to go around someone. In German, that's the important. So it's the same word. So does this tell us that Germans don't care if you run someone over? <laughs> and then if you put it in the past, that would be um umfahren in the past though. Still umfahren, okay. And this would be umgefahren. So there's a good and I think as a teacher, especially if we have someone where it's the second language. You have to be able to explain to them why there is a gay and here not. Mm, interesting. That's an excellent point. Thank you. So you have to know the linguistics and the very basic to actually explain that. Yeah. Why why, why is there a gay? Uh it's about pronunciation. It's umfahren or umfahren. <laughs> umfahren or umfahren. Yeah. Oh, it's about the stress. Yes. Oh, okay. Okay. So that's the difference then you know, where to put the get or not. Mm -hmm. Or also there's word where you can like yeah, but um, I don't know, it doesn't work with this word. We we have words that you can like split mm -hmm. and words that you can't. Mm -hmm. And also that's about stress. I see, okay. So that's called an infix. We might learn about that later. Thank you for your excellent example. By the way, if anyone, I know we've got many people from different countries here. We've got a Korean, we've got Americans, we've got a German. Um, are you, I'm sorry, are you German or Austrian? Swiss. Swiss. <laughs> Swiss. If you have any examples from another language, please share it with the class because we all speak, we all speak English here. A lot of us speak Chinese, but not everyone speaks these other languages and it will enrich our discussion. So it's really cool. Thank you. So as we can see, linguistics is a very broad field of study. If we study linguistics, it opens the door for a lot of work in our future and also a lot more research in any number of areas. It helps us with education, it opens the door to cultural studies, it opens the door to history and anthropology, to politics and law even. Why would we say that? Because if we can figure out linguistically why someone speaks a certain way, maybe you could assist the detective, realize whether he's innocent or not, or just for example. There's a lot of things we can do with it. It's a very cool, um, it's a very cool field of study. Even though it seems nerdy, and let's be real, it is pretty nerdy, but it's very useful. One of the most nerdy things you can do with it, in fact, is invent your own language for a TV show or a book. Uh, have, have you guys seen Game of Thrones? Yeah. yeah. So Dothraki is a language invented for this book series. It was originally written as a book, but they expanded it for this the TV series on Netflix, and. Um, it's really interesting. It's a real language that you could totally learn if you wanted to. And it's not the first one of its kind either. Um, if you've seen The Lord of the Rings, um, they also have entire languages that have been invented from scratch that are linguistically complete languages that you could speak if you wanted to. Star Trek did a similar thing with Vulcan. There's a lot of these invented languages that you would need a background in linguistics to be able to make realistic and to be able to make um, functional, as opposed to just babble. And it adds a lot to programs like this. It's really cool. Even Yoda. <laughs> so what's going on with Yoda's grammar here? Who can explain what this is? Right. So normally in English, a lot of our basic sentences are SVO, right? Subject, yeah. verb, object. What's going on here? It switched around. So what would that be? I still have much to learn. I still have much to learn, right? In this case, it's object, verb, subject. Much to learn. 
I still have. So it's OBS. And some languages really do work that way. I believe Russian works that way. It's OBS, just, just normally. But I'm not, I don't speak Russian, so I'm not sure about that. I just heard that. So if you want to do some fun readings, we can watch a YouTube video. Uh, that YouTube video, did you already watch this today? No. No? Okay, and this CNBC link is just to the Game of Thrones language. Um, so if you want to do more research on that, uh, you can access this PowerPoint later, and you can you can click on this page or, or Google it. Um, let's watch this video. And by the way, if we run out of things to do today, if we finish up Tiffany's PowerPoint, we're just going to end early. <laughs> yes. This is a short introduction to structural linguistics and its concepts. Ferdinand de Saussure is a Swiss linguist accredited with founding the field of structural linguistics, a radical new theory of language as a structured system. He is often referred to as the father of modern linguistics, an honor divided between him and Noam Chomsky in the class. His most influential work, A Course in General Linguistics, was published posthumously in 1916. But what is structural linguistics? Well, it's the idea to... that language is a system of contrasting problems. In structural linguistics, language consists of strings of existing objects. These objects are defined only through the fact that they contrast with other objects in the language system. This was an entirely new way of thinking about languages and presented a radical change from previous approaches. In order to begin to understand structural linguistics, we first need to understand the key ideas. First, there's the sign. So pseudo sign consists of the signifier and the signified. The signifier is the sounds of the letters used to denote what we're talking about. Signified is the actual concept of the thing. That is, the idea in our minds we hear or read the signifier. The actual real thing in the world is called the referent. Note the difference between the thought of a cat and an actual real cat. The sign is a two-sided psychological entity, as one can't exist without the other. It just couldn't be a sign. Imagine a coin of just one side. You can't, right? Secondly, Saussure highlights that there is an arbitrary and conventional relationship between a signifier and its signified. Arbitrary because there's no natural reason why we call a cat a cat. And that's why different languages have different words for the same thing. The convention of language refers to the idea that a speech community needs to adhere to the same connections between a signifier and its signified. For example, English speakers all share a very similar concept of cat when they hear that word. I can't just start calling a cat the dog and expect anyone to know what I'm talking about. Thirdly, Saussure distinguishes between the use of language, parole, and the system of language, long. Long being the system of language, such as syntax or phonology, is an abstract system. Parole, on the other hand, is the use of that language, and this is an individual matter. Have you noticed that people have their own language quirks? Well, this is the individual side, the actual use of language. Fourthly, Saussure distinguishes between synchrony and diachrony. Synchrony refers to a complete language system at just one point in time. Think of it as a snapshot of language. Diachrony, on the other hand, is how that language develops over time. This is also known as historical linguistics. You may have noticed changes in language over your lifetime, with different words appearing or disappearing, or slight pronunciation changes. That's diachrony. The fifth and final thing we'll go over is the paradigm and the syntagm. They represent two axes used to describe languages. The syntagm is the linear pattern or sequence of linguistic objects. For example, the words in a sentence, the cat sat on the mat. It can also be the sounds in a word, for example, clay. This axis is essentially one of contrast. You can't swap words around in the sentence without scrambling the meaning. And likewise, you can't swap the letters in clay around without destroying the arbitrary connection between the signifier and the signified. The paradigm refers to a group of linguistic objects which have similarities and that can replace one another in syntagm. Take the earlier syntagm, the cat sat on the map. You can replace cat with dog or baby, but in this particular syntagm, you can't use a word like fish. Fish just can't sit. But in a different syntagm, they could be used to replace cat. For example, in the syntagm, I like all animals, especially fish. So just because some objects have a paradigmatic relationship in one specific syntagm, doesn't mean that it holds in all contexts. Let's look at another example using sounds in the word clay. 
In this syntag, the C can be replaced by P to produce play, but we can't replace the C with a T. English doesn't allow the TL sequence. Another syntag, still. Here we can replace the T with a P to produce the syntag of still. The T and the P belong to the same paradigm in this example. The axes of the syntag and the paradigm are key to understanding what Sussu means when he talks about meaning depending on the systems of the language. So why is any of this interesting? Well, until Sussu started forming his ideas about language, the study of language is laden with belief. Sussu stressed that language was structural, thereby freeing it from associations, be they social, cultural, political, historical. Practically, this approach to language means that it is studied based on structural relations alone. A linguistic object's meaning is understood through its contrast with other linguistic objects in the system. Language is therefore a static system of these interconnected linguistic objects. That was a very dense video and I recommend that you watch it again because mm -hmm. there was a lot of vocabulary in here we will be using the rest of Hi again YouTube, it's that one guy in one class and today I'm going to be talking about the birth not me. <laughs> There's a lot of vocabulary in there we're going to be using the rest of this semester uh, and it's just interesting. So the, the in a nutshell, structural linguistics was a new way of looking at language as an arbitrary uh, construct. Why do we say cats when we mean meow? There actually is no reason that we say this specific sound, cat, and there is no reason why we spell it C-A-T, except that we do. It's called arbitrary. We just do say it that way, and everyone who speaks English agrees on it, and so we can all communicate and be on the same page. This might seem like a really obvious thing to you, but it wasn't always the case. That's why this was a revolution. And to illustrate that, let me use one English word. So if I want to write down, let's say, a word like unforgettable, how would I do that? What do I need to do to this word to write it? I spell it, right? I have to spell the word, and if I spell it wrong, maybe you can still kind of read it. So like if I forget the L-E, I just write L, unforgettable, maybe you can still sort of read it, but if it's too bad, then you wouldn't be able to read it because I've spelled it wrong. Uh, what does Harry Potter do? Spell. He casts a spell. Why is this word spell and this word spell the same word? Because traditionally in English, many people believed that if you wrote down a word, that you would have power over someone or that you would do something. In some way, the word was magic. You would spell something and that did something. And this belief is, is ancient. It goes back to ancient Greece. It goes back to ancient Rome and, and beyond that. Um, it's, it's very fascinating if you want to study that part of historical linguistics. But this is just one little factoid to illustrate that this structural belief that linguistics is built and is a system that we can all influence, but is built arbitrarily simply to help us communicate, is a relatively new one. And I recommend that you carry it forward, especially if you want to do any research in historical linguistics. Let's see. Oh, not you. Okay, so this is going to be the last thing that we do today because we are beginning to run out of time for our group discussion. One, two, and three, why is linguistics, the study of language, important in our life? Let's get some examples of applying linguistics to technology, an example of language invention, movies, dramas, or novels. We have five groups, but only three topics. So if we simply split people up like topic one, topic two, topic three, do you think that's fair? Okay, and can you work with them because they're sad and like three people? Thank you. <laughs> they need more friends. Sure. Awesome. You're a good friend. Yeah. Okay, let's discuss this for five minutes in our groups and then share what we come up with the class.
All right, guys, one more minute. Oh, oh. I love this. I love this. I love All right, let's see what we got. Group one, please. To you guys, why is linguistics, the study of language, important in our life? Think that linguistics will help us understand the, the world. Um, because we can use linguistics to know different languages. So, uh, yes. <laughs> we can communicate with uh, uh, to the people that are not, uh, didn't, didn't speak the same language Okay, awesome. Very nice, thank you. And I'll say that linguistics, a knowledge of linguistics, it doesn't teach you a foreign language, but if you kind of know how languages work, it becomes easier to learn a foreign language. It really does. Studying linguistics helped me to, to learn Chinese. Would you guys mind expl explaining some uh, some uh, linguistics applications and technology? Sure, we have a lot of examples. I'm sure you can. <laughs> I think for, for all the modern technologies that has something to do with like voice or written, like language. Definitely. Okay. So for example, AI, artificial intelligence, Siri, Google Translate, Alexia, um, Tesla voice control, yep. cars, um, or chat GPT, mm -hmm. or any voice research, you know, kind of applications, or like paraphrasers, mm -hmm. rapidly, or any just like computer programs. They are kind of like, you know, linguistic involved. Absolutely. And in fact, computers themselves are a form of linguistics because computer programming is very basic linguistics. It's like talking to a baby that somehow has power over the world. You have to use a specific set of grammar and commands to program the computer to do a thing. Mm -hmm. That's really cool. And finally, what are some examples of language invention that you guys thought of? Uh, thank you. Edwin, uh, before he jumped to another group. Oh, hold on a second. <laughs> Is your name actually Edwin? Yes, Edwin. Nice! I like your jeans. <laughs> 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 
He told them that that avatar uh, that they invented the Navi language in me because we were thinking about maybe we could find some examples in Chinese or in Korean, but we couldn't think of any. So yeah, in movies, avatar they created their language, and I remember maybe in Frozen, mm -hmm. uh, but I'm not sure. Is like in Frozen two, the uh, Elsa sort of spoke another language from her mother. But maybe that is an actual language, so I'm not sure. But um, they uh, the story was was based on some North European culture. So I think I heard some words, and maybe that's not true. It maybe also invented. And we have one more example from please. Yes, it's not movie channel in robots, but. Do you know Esperanto? It's by Esperanto. Esperanto, yes, I know Esperanto. Yes, it's, it's uh, invented as a uh, international international of this language. Mm -hmm. Yes. Uh, but do people really No, not oh, at all. Okay. But that's a very good example. Yeah. So, would you like to say more about it, or would you like me to? <laughs> Okay, so if you I, I, if you have heard of this language Esperanto, could you please raise your hand? You people, you people. So if you don't know about it, I recommend you look it up because it's an interesting example of linguistics in action. It's about a hundred years old now. Esperanto was invented after World War One in Europe to be a new European language. It was based off the the foundational grammar points and syntax of all uh, well Romance languages anyway, descending from Latin. And the idea was that it would be relatively easy for anyone who speaks almost any European language to learn and then speak, and the, in the hopes that communication would be fostered and that more peace would be developed among all the nations of Europe. But it didn't work. People still use it sometimes today, but no one speaks it. It's almost exclusively a joke for like <laughs> linguistic professors to learn. <laughs> it's relatively easy to learn if you can speak a European language. So they learn it, and then they write things in it, but just sort of as a, as a joke. <laughs> Why do you think that Esperanto didn't take off? It's too similar to their own language. Maybe. So there's no use case for it. Yes, it's like uh, other people can still survive with their own language without <clears throat> Esperanto. Mm -hmm. So it's not necessarily important to, to communication. That's possible. That's possible. And I, for the record, there is no one right answer about this. It's just, what do you think? So it's possible that it simply wasn't useful enough to people. Another suggestion is that because this language has no culture, there's not really a, a feeling of wanting to learn it. There's no movies in Esperanto. There's no Esperanto poetry. You know, it's only a tool. Maybe they can create a kind of coffee name. <laughs> That's a good idea. Yeah. Nice, nice. Anyway, so thank you very much. I appreciate all of your examples. I hope that you've come away from this, this first class of the semester believing that, that linguistics is not only a dry academic subject, but also something that's alive and living and that we can use in our daily lives in a number of different ways, depending on what we want to do after we graduate. I appreciate all of your time, and I think that's the end of the class. So if anyone has any questions for me, please. Otherwise, you can enjoy your lunch. Okay. It's very nice meeting you all. We're seeing you today. Uh, if I if my thesis goes well, yes. Okay. But you still live in Taiwan. Yeah, I live in Central. Oh, Okay, Jenny, we're going to get off, off the class now because we are finished. So thank you very much for attending. I hope that you enjoyed it. And I'll, I hope to see you next week. Take care. Thank you. Bye-bye. See you next week. <laughs>